All right, how are these Lewis structures looking? So I'm going to put. The, I'm going to draw the Lewis structures um, because we, we did this yesterday. So that'll be kind of our starting point today. These were the two major resonance forms that we talked about. Okay. All right, now let's look at them. Um, we'll look at the first top one first. What's the shape of the top molecule? Linear. It's got two groups on the center atom, it's linear. What about the bottom one? Same thing. So the resonance in this case doesn't change that shape, and that will be true for most cases because you're just moving the electrons around, the hybridizations uh, stay the same. Um, okay, so now what about the hybridization on that carbon? What's the hybridization here? This is sp, right? Two groups, we need two hybrid orbitals, sp, that's two. What about this one? That's also going to be sp. Two groups, two hybrid orbitals, sp. Um, I think an issue with hybridization is sometimes we make it harder than it needs to be. It goes with the groups. However many groups are around, electron groups are around that central atom, that determines the hybridization. So if it's two groups, it's sp. Three groups, sp2. Four groups, sp3. Five groups, sp3d. Six groups, sp3d2. That's it. Right? Um, doesn't matter if those groups are lone pairs or atoms or whatever. They, all, they always go with that number of electron groups. All right, now let's look at the polarity. Are these molecules polar or nonpolar? How do you know? Why polar? Because of the charge. Well, um, but, but the resonance tells us that the charge is shared evenly on both sides, right? Because resonance means. It's a hybrid of both of those things. Yeah, and that's the other thing is polarity is determined by electronegativity, not charge. If you're not sure, not real comfortable with polarity yet, do it the way that we talked about when we were first learning it. Look at each individual bond, determine if just that bond is polar, and then add them together and see if you get any um, imbalance, if they don't cancel each other out. So let's look at the first one. Is a CN bond polar? Is one of these elements more electronegative than the other? Yeah. Yes, nitrogen is, right? so that is a bit polar. What about CS? Yeah, it's, you could say maybe, um, it is, actually if you look at the numbers, it's not, but for our purposes now, that's okay. Um, if you had to guess, would you say that a CN bond is more polar or a CS bond is more polar? Yeah. CN, okay. So what does that tell you about the overall polarity of the molecule? That it's polar, because what you're saying then is that the dipole or the difference in electronegativity between the C and the N is greater than the difference in electronegativity between the C and the S. And if you imagine adding these two things together, your overall dipole is in this direction, but a little bit smaller than the CN. If you actually look up the numbers, I believe carbon and sulfur are both 2.5, so there actually isn't a difference in polarity. Well, you got it, right? You you just estimate. You don't, you don't necessarily need to know the numbers. You look at the periodic table and you say, well, I'm not sure about CS, but I know the CN is going to be a more electronegative, bigger difference in electronegativity than CS. But CS is close by Right, but we know that the first, um, the, the second row has the greatest electronegativity there, and then it drops off pretty significantly as you go down. Mm -hmm. So the trend from down the periodic table is 
up, has bigger stuff, bigger steps or bigger jumps than the trend across. Um, so like a carbon chlorine bond is slightly polar, but not nearly as polar as a carbon fluorine bond. So this is how you do it. You add up, you add up the little vectors and you see. Now if you have a totally symmetric molecule, whether it's linear or um, pretty much any of the other totally symmetric shapes, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, um, octahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, whatever, if they're symmetric and they have the same atoms all the way around, there's a good chance that's not polar because they're all going to cancel each other out. It's when you see these differences that you can start to think, well, yeah, there's probably polarity here. Okay, let's move on. Do we have any internet friends today? Oh, we do. Hello, whoever's watching. Okay. What? Didn't he say he had to drive somewhere? Well, maybe he's watching while driving. <laughs> drive safely, please. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about molecular orbitals. So the reason we talk about this, this is probably the most difficult concept to kind of grasp. Would you agree, Akash, of the whole semester? You're okay with it? All right. Well, yeah, I guess it depends on how you do with the math stuff and whatever, too. But um, we're definitely going to get in some weird territory here. And you're going to kind of have to just, just take what I tell you as, like, that there's actual math behind it that, that works. Because we're going to talk about some weird stuff. Um, but this, what we talked about so far, the localized electron model, let's think about what that means. Localized electrons. What? He is watching? All right. Um, localized electrons means that we're keeping the electrons localized on the atoms. Right? So that means that we have atomic orbitals, S and P and D orbitals. We hybridize them into SP, SP3, whatever kind of hybrid orbitals. But they stay on the atoms. And then the individual atoms connect to each other through these individual atomic orbitals, and the electrons stay basically with their atoms, right? and they connect together. That doesn't work in a lot of situations. All right, and it doesn't predict, I didn't say it doesn't work, it doesn't predict some things that we also want to account for. Specifically, uneven numbers of electrons. Right? We talked about that when we do Lewis structures. Um, what happens if you have if you don't have an even number of electrons, if you have seven electrons or nine electrons, the Lewis structure thing all gets screwed up. It doesn't quite work anymore. And the same thing with hybridization. Does a single electron count as an electron group or not? I mean, it's not, we didn't just ignore that because um, it's tricky. We ignored it because it doesn't really work. So we need another model for that. Um, and then what about delocalized electrons? Anybody know what that means? Electrons that aren't stuck on their atoms. Um, i trying to think of a, I don't have an example off the top of my head, but when we've been dealing with some Lewis structures, occasionally we've come up with structures where you said, well, this structure can't be right because it's got a carbon and carbon, or it's got a nitrogen, and nitrogen only has five electrons to give, but then it seems to have all the other electrons on it too, right? Delocalized electrons, this idea of you dump all the electrons into a big pot, and then you spread it out over the whole molecule. The localized electron model doesn't really account for that because it says that each atom is hybridized on its own and using its own atomic orbitals. So instead, we use something called molecular orbitals. Okay, and let me just give you a quick discussion of what we what, what a molecular orbital means. The localized electron model says we take atomic orbitals, which are the individual orbitals on atoms, and we kind of mix them, we push them together, and that creates the molecule. The molecular orbital says, we take the atomic orbitals, we all combine them together over the entire molecule, and we make new orbitals that we call molecular orbitals. So these are new descriptions of electron behavior that go over the entire molecule instead of just on the atoms. We're no, we're no longer looking at the orbitals on each atom. We're saying they come together, and now we're looking at the orbitals over the entire molecule. So that's the idea of a molecular orbital. And to do that, we have to talk about what, um, what exactly a molecular orbital is 
and how we figure out what they are and what they look like and, and which ones come about for which molecule. So let's start with our atomic orbitals. We're going to start with the simplest possible molecule and talk about how we build molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals. Simplest molecule, hydrogen. Two hydrogen atoms. Okay? So let's draw that. We're going to draw two 1s orbitals. We're going to call this A. We'll call this 1sA for hydrogen A. And we're going to call this 1sB for hydrogen B. And let's just put an electron in there somewhere so we know that it's got an electron. Each of these have an electron. Okay. So before, with the localized electron model, we would say these two orbitals combine and bond with each other. Now we're saying these two orbitals combine to form two new orbitals that, in, that are going over the entire molecule. We call those molecular orbitals. So instead of atomic orbitals, they're no longer atomic orbitals. They're going to be molecular orbitals. And there are two ways that two things can come together. And those are called linear combinations. You can make a molecular orbital one way by adding them together. You can make a molecular orbital a second way by subtracting them from each other. So that's, that's just known as a linear combination. There's two ways to um, combine things in a linear fashion. You can either add them or you can subtract them. Right? So it's like every possibility. As we get more orbitals, there will be more possibilities because you could add, subtract, add, or add, add, subtract, or whatever when there's more. But when there's just two, you can add them together or you can subtract them. And so now let's look at what those two things would look like and how we would express them. Um, oh, wait. Sorry. Yeah, right here. So I'm going to take 1SA and 1SB and add them together. So here's the 1S from hydrogen A. The one S from hydrogen B. If we add them, we get something that looks like this. Okay, you can imagine them just kind of combining, and that's sort of what it would look like, right? And we're going to call that MO1, which is a sigma type orbital. We talked about sigma bonds. Well, now we're going to say that what that really is is a sigma orbital over the whole molecules. And this is an important way to distinguish between atomic orbitals and molecular orbitals. Atomic orbitals use um, English letters, and molecular orbitals use Greek letters. Do you have a question? No, okay. Um, so atomic orbitals are things like S and P. And molecular orbitals are things like sigma and pi. So we're going to use this. All right, and then the, here comes the weird one. What happens when you subtract two orbitals from each other? There's nothing left, sort of, but there is actually. There's actually the reciprocal of what was there. Not the reciprocal, but the opposite of what was there. So if we subtract... 1SA and 1SB. We have to think about something that we haven't really talked about. Um, we, we've mentioned it briefly, but not really in depth. And that is the phase of an orbital. I don't know if you've noticed in your book, but sometimes the orbitals are shown as kind of being shaded, like one side shaded or the other side shaded, or like a P orbital. Sometimes you see it half filled and half empty. That's actually an important part of the math that describes what those orbitals are. And so an orbital can have a phase. And if the phases match, you get a match and you get a mixing like this. If the phases don't match, then they can't mix. So what we're going to say here is that the negative of an orbital that looks like this, the, the opposite of it, 
is the opposite phase, which we usually represent as it filled in. So the opposite of an orbital is its opposite phase. Um, another way we can draw this with a p orbital. So a p orbital, we haven't really drawn it this way because we haven't had to worry about this, but a p orbital actually has two phases within the orbital. One that we'll say colored in and one that's empty. They used to say plus and minus, but that makes it sound like there's charges and stuff, so we'll just stick with phases, colored or not colored. And the opposite of a p orbital then is the orbital with opposite phases, like that. And the important thing about phases is that phases that match can bond, you can mix. Phases that don't match can't mix, and in, and in fact, they sort of repel each other. So the subtraction of these two orbitals then becomes this. Yep, that together is one orbital, but they don't mix. They're just separate. And we're going to call and this is the MO2 from above. And we call this type of, of an orbital a sigma star orbital. And sigma star, the little star is for the phases not lining up. If the phases do line up, we call that a bonding orbital. And if the phases don't line up, we call that antibonding. So this one is going to be antibonding. That's right. So what are they? Sorry, okay, here we go. Molecular, so now what we can do is put this together in something called a molecular orbital diagram, which is a way that we can systematically build up the molecular orbitals and figure out where the electrons are. Because remember, the electrons started in the atomic orbitals, but now we're going to lump them all together and redistribute them in the molecular orbitals. Um, important things to note, first, as we see up here, you always have the same number of molecular orbitals as you started with with atomic orbitals. So if you start with two atomic orbitals, like we do here, one on each atom, you must form two molecular orbitals, which we also do here, the sigma and the sigma star, the MO1 and MO2. So we're going to put together a diagram and show how this works. And this is, this is what you do. And we'll, we'll kind of get um, uh, more and more complex as we go, but we'll start with this example. So we're going to put, this is how I usually start them. Put a hydrogen on each side, and then the molecule in the middle. And in this class, we'll, um, we'll stop at diatomic molecules, meaning molecules that just have two atoms. Um, we can do molecular orbitals for any complexity of molecules, but that's sort of a topic for another class. So we'll stop here. So you can put each of your atoms in the either side, and then the molecule in the middle. And then we're going to list the orbitals from each side. So hydrogen, each atom, has a 1s orbital. And we're going to just draw it as a little line, kind of like when we did the electron counting, um, because it has an electron in it. And we're going to call this the 1s orbitals, because it is the 1s orbital. The other hydrogen also has a 1s orbital with one electron in it. So each side, it's just the electron configuration of the um, molecules. And specifically of the valence orbitals. OK. Now we have to figure out how to build up the molecular orbitals from that. So we say, OK, uh, there's a 1s orbital in each case. And they have to be combined into molecular orbitals. And the ways we can combine them is we can add them, or we can subtract them, the things that we just talked about up here. Now, the more um, bonding an, an, an orbital is, 
the lower energy it is. So that's another aspect of that, of this, is that the y-axis here is an energy scale. Things we put lower are lower energy, and things we put higher are higher energy. So we're ranking these in terms of energy. When we do electron configurations here for, for larger atoms, we're going to rank them from bottom to top, just like we do um, you know, 1s, 2s, 2p, whatever. So the molecular orbitals are going to look like this. The lower energy orbital is going to be the sigma, or MO1, The MO1 label is not important. The sigma label is. So actually, let's not call it MO1. Let's call it something more descriptive. This is the sigma, the sigma orbital formed from the 1s atomic orbitals. So we're going to call that sigma 1s. That'll, it, that's not important here because it's just hydrogen, but in a more complex molecule, we want to make sure to um, distinguish like the sigma that's formed from the S's from the sigma that's formed from the P's and stuff. So. All right, and then our other orbital is going to be higher in energy, and that's going to be our sigma 1s star, the star for the antibond. Okay. So the bottom one is the addition of the two orbitals. The top one is the subtraction of the two orbitals. And we're not quite done yet. We also, usually in these diagrams, draw little dotted lines to show which molecular orbitals came from which atomic orbitals. Right. So that just kind of keeps it straight when we have a bunch of them that we can see, well, this orbital came from these and this orbital came from and then the final step is to take the electrons from the atoms and put from the atomic orbitals and put them in the molecular orbitals. So we pool the electrons together, which gives us how many total? In this case, two. And then we refill the orbitals, the molecular orbitals, from the bottom to the top. So that's one, two. Okay, now let's, let's talk about what this means and what this tells us. So, as I said, and this is kind of a weird thing, but the atomic orbitals no longer exist. In a molecular orbital theory picture, once atoms form a molecule, there are no atomic orbitals anymore. There are only the molecular orbitals, which take up the entire molecule. So, we took those ones from the side and we built these new ones. The hydrogen molecule no longer has any s orbitals in it, it has these orbitals in it, a sigma and a sigma star. Okay. And uh, one thing that we can tell from this that we could not, or that we can sometimes get wrong in the localized electron model is the bond order. That is, how many bonds are between the two atoms. And there's a, a formula that you can use to get this. Right? It's the difference between the number of bonding electrons and the number of anti-bonding electrons divided by two. So bond order equals bonding electrons, that is, at electrons that are in a molecular orbital without a star, minus Antibonding electrons, electrons in a molecule without a star, or with a star, with a star, divided by two. So let's use that formula up in our um, thing here, up in our molecular orbital diagram. Our bond order is going to be bonding electrons, which is how many? Two minus antibonding electrons, zero, because there's no electrons in our antibonding orbital, divided by two, 
which is 1. So that tells us that the molecular orbit orbital theory predicts a single bond between hydrogen and hydrogen. And would you say that that's probably an accurate prediction? Yeah, because that, that is what we see in a hydrogen molecule. So one thing that we'll do is when we make these molecular orbital diagrams, we'll look at the bond order and decide whether that um, bond should be single, double, triple, or maybe whether it shouldn't exist. It'll also tell us some things about whether or not we can predict uh, what happens to a molecule when it gains or loses electrons. Um, let's talk about hydrogen. If hydrogen loses an electron, what happens to the bond order? becomes one half, right? If it loses one of these electrons, then the calculation is one minus zero divided by two, which is one half. So that tells us that a hydrogen molecule that's lost an electron, or an H2 plus ion, would be less stable than an H2 molecule. What about if it gains an electron? What's the bond order if this molecule gains an electron? Uh, try again. Still one half, because that third electron goes into the anti-bonding orbital since only two electrons fit per orbital. So now your calculation becomes 2 minus 1 over 2, which is still a half. So you say the same thing. If hydrogen were to gain an electron, that would destabilize that bond and maybe break it apart. Okay. All right, so let's try one on your own now. Maybe not totally on your own. I'll help you out a little bit. The helium-2 molecule. I'll give you a big hint. It should look pretty much the same as hydrogen because it has the same orbitals. 1s, 1s, right? They come together and they form a sigma and a sigma star. What's going to be the difference in the dihelium molecule? Right, number of electrons. So you're going to have a, a, some additional electrons to deal with. See if you can do it. Build the same type of diagram that we just built, but now put the new number of electrons in it and see what happens. Uh, what happens, meaning, like, bond order. And then we'll get into some bigger molecules. This other thing up here so you can look at it while you're doing this. Thank you. 
All right, so as I said, this molecular orbital diagram should look pretty much the same. You've got um, helium on each side, dihelium in the middle, whatever that would be. The difference is our electrons. So let's, let's um, because I saw a couple different variations here, let's be clear here. The diagram itself, the ordering of the molecular orbitals and whatever, that comes from the orbitals. It has nothing to do with the electrons. So you look at the orbitals and you figure out the, um, what molecular orbitals should be there. Okay. That also means for, edit, for any two molecules or to any two atoms that come together that are in the same column, the same, or not the same column, the same row, uh, it's going to look pretty much the same because they all have the same orbitals. If you've got two atoms with a 1s orbital, that are, that's going to look the same. And then as we'll see when we have 2s and 2p, and those will kind of look all the same too. Um, so we don't have to do new work here. The orbitals, the molecular orbitals are derived from the atomic orbitals, not from the electrons or anything else. Uh, now we've got those molecular orbitals. The only difference is we have more electrons to fill them with. So we fill them the same way you would fill an atom. You start at the bottom, go one, two, What do you mean? Right, I'm just labeling the orbital. This is the two electrons in there. So yes, you, yes, they have two electrons. I'm just saying this is a 1s orbital. Yeah. So we have one, two here, but, but we haven't used them all yet, right? We've got two more to go. So where do they have to go? Right, the next one up. Okay, we can't put more than two in an orbital, so we just go up to the next one in order, whatever, whatever it is. There's only two here, but soon there will be more. And you just start filling in on the way up. Okay, so now here is a complete correct molecular orbital diagram for the dihelium molecule. Um, so what do you think about the bond order? What's the bond order here? Zero, right? Because we've got two bonding electrons minus two anti-bonding electrons. What does that tell you about this molecule? The what? It doesn't bond, yeah, exactly. So the dihelium molecule actually doesn't exist. And, this, and the molecular orbital theory predicted that by saying that there shouldn't be a bond between two helium atoms based on its, its electrons and its orbitals. If you think about that in terms of energy, that makes sense. What we're saying up in here in hydrogen what we said up here in hydrogen is that when two hydrogen atoms come together, they form molecular orbitals, and the electrons uh, fill the lower energy orbital. And so this situation in the middle is at a lower energy overall than the situation on either side. If you have two electrons at this level of energy, and then they go to this level of energy, that's a stabilizing effect. In helium, that's not the case. In helium, you had four electrons at this level, Two of them came here, and two of them came here, so the energy in the middle is actually the same as the energy on the sides. So they don't bond. There's no favor, um, there's no energetic favor of, of that bond, or advantage to doing that bond. All right, ready to get a little trickier? Okay. So now we're going to talk about ho other homonuclear diatomic molecules, which are atoms that are um, of the same nucleus, right, with two of them, two of the same ones. So the first one we'll consider is Li2. We're just going to kind of go across and see what we get. How is lithium-2 a little bit different? Well, we have different orbitals to deal with. So we start with the same idea, lithium, lithium, and here's dilithium in the middle. But now we have some different orbitals because lithium is in the 2, right? Is in the 2 shell, n equals 2 shell. So now we're going to have a 2s and a 2p.
Remember the two P, there are three of them and they're all at the same energy. So we draw them all at the same energy. What about the electrons? Where are the electrons in lithium? How many electrons in the lithium atom? In the valence shell? One, right? Because two of them are in the core. We don't deal with core electrons here, just the valence electrons. Core electrons don't participate in bonding. So there's two electrons in the 1s, which is in the core, and then one electron in the 2s, which is the valence shell. All right. So other than the, P, the existence of the p orbitals there, this doesn't look a whole lot different from um, hydrogen, right? Because you got two s orbitals on either one, eight, one s orbital on either side with one electron in each. So let's put these together. The two s orbitals are going to combine to form either a sigma bonding interaction. We'll put that one down here. This is going to be our sigma from the 2s and a sigma star antibonding from the subtraction of those two orbitals. And in fact, 2s orbitals will always make those two molecular orbitals. doesn't matter if they're 2s's, 3s's, 4s's, 5s's, 6s's, whatever. If s orbitals come together to form molecules, this is how they do it. They form a sigma of lower energy and a sigma star of higher energy. The P's will also form molecular orbitals, but we're actually not going to deal with them right now because there are no electrons in there, so we don't have to worry. We'll get to them in a minute when we get over to the P block. But right now we can just say that they're, they're in there, but it's not important what, what they are um, because they're not, they don't have any electrons. So if we're just looking at the S block then, how do we fill the electrons? Same way. We're going to put two here, right? And none in the sigma star. So what's the bond order then for lithium? One. Right, so we got two bonding, no antibonding, bond order is one. So would you expect the Li2 molecule to exist? Yeah, yeah it does. Mm -hmm. And we can do the same thing for beryllium right next door. Nothing changes except the number of electrons, just like the difference between hydrogen and helium. So for a Be2 molecule, you just expect that you'll get um, a bond order of zero because you have two more electrons that you have to put up here. Now let's get a little fancy. What happens when we jump over to boron? Well, we need to start incorporating the p orbitals into these um, molecular orbitals. So what? Let's look at the different ways that p orbitals can overlap or can combine. We looked at how s orbitals combine. Let's look at how p orbitals can combine. There's two ways p orbitals can combine, and then they can do so in either a bonding way or an anti-bonding way. So the first way is going to be the, what we call the sigma bond from a p orbital. And that's what happens when you have two p orbitals that are in phase. And they're end on end, like this. If they combine together, that gives you something that looks like this. Can you see how they form that shape? Kind of the, the two things mushed together. So here you have P plus P equals sigma from the P. So whatever it is, if it's a 2P and a 2P, then we make a sigma that comes from the 2p. Why is that a sigma? Well, remember, there's two types of ways orbitals come together, sigma and pi. Sigma is when two lobes kind of mash together like that. And then pi is the other way that p orbitals can interact, when rather than being end on end, they're parallel. So a pi orbital that comes from p's is when you have p orbitals in this type of an orientation. And now there's a couple of different ways you could draw this. Um, 
let's just kind of do it like this. So you get the idea. I'm going to try to finish the P orbital. We'll see, I have an idea of what they're supposed to look like. But you get the idea. They kind of mash together on the tops. Another way we could draw this. It's just kind of like this. They mash together. So that's what's known as a pi molecular orbital. And we'll have to see some of those, too. Or we will see some of those, too. We can also look at the antibonding equivalents for these two. So what does it look like? If you have a sigma star or an antibond from the two p's, that's going to be this one minus this one. And if you're subtracting it, that means you're using the opposite phase. And your book has really nice pictures because this orbital actually looks a little fancier than this. I just kind of draw it as two next to each other. But in reality, it kind of, one, like the middles get flattened out because they're repelling each other. And the out opposite sides get a little bit bigger. Anyway, it looks a little bit different. Um, let's see if I can find a, a picture of that. There's got to be something on the internets, right? Mm -hmm. um, See if we can see some pictures of all of them here. Well, perhaps the internet is too slow for such things right now. Let's see. This one looks pretty good. Let's try this one. We may not. We're trying to do too much with the broadcasting and whatnot. Yeah, it's not really a great picture either. Um, I know, that's what wouldn't load that the first time. We'll let it work on it, and we'll keep going. So anyway, the important thing is you have these two types. Now let's also look at the um, pi star, the anti-bonding pi orbital. If you subtract these two, that means you have to invert the second one. So a pi molecular, a pi star molecular orbital looks like this. Sometimes with these antibonding orbitals, a dotted line is drawn in. This is called a node, and it's just saying that there's a, a repulsion there, that there's an area where the electrons can't go. So this whole thing is known as a pi star orbital, or a sigma star orbital. And this whole thing is the pi star orbital. Even though it doesn't look like it's one thing, it looks like two things. It's one molecular orbital. And these are for diatomic molecules. When you have larger molecules that have mul more atoms than just two, the molecular orbitals take all the orbitals from all the different atoms into account and make these all kinds of crazy elaborate looking things that you can't really draw, but you can use computers to calculate what they would look like. All right, uh, some general rules, as we've already talked about, of, of ranking the energies. As we've already talked about, bonding orbitals are generally lower in energy than antibonding orbitals. And um, for the same types of orbitals. And sigma orbitals are generally lower in energy than pi orbitals. Yeah, uh, what it says here, we would expect the sigma bond to be lower in energy than the pi bond, generally. 
Um, and that's because of where the electrons are located. It's a slightly lower energy interaction to have them between, or in the internuclear axis in between the two molecules than on either side. All right, so let's try one of these now, now that we know of these different types of interactions. And we're going to look at um, um, the molecular orbitals here. And then we'll, go, we'll get back to magnetism. Let me, let's get some extra space here. We'll do boron. So, give yourself plenty of room here. We got to get our uh, atomic orbitals first, and then we'll put them together and make the molecular orbitals. Anybody else? Or just take off. Um, so let's give ourselves plenty of room. Remember, we're still just using the valence orbitals. But hey, people got to buy their drugs, you know. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to accuse him of being a drug dealer. That's probably rude. Let's let's put our atomic orbitals in first. So we've got 2s and 2p on each side. Match, same energy. And let's put in the electrons. In each atom, we have two electrons in the 2s and one in the 2p. Um, and then we're going to combine them. So first, we'll combine the two S's in the way that we know they combine. Same thing we've seen in all the molecules previous to this. What are we going to have here? How many atomic orbitals do we form from these two, two S, or how many molecular orbitals do we form from the two, two S atomic orbitals? Two, and what are they going to be? A sigma and sigma star. So we'll have our sigma orbital that's lower in energy and our sigma star that's higher in energy. And we're going to put all the electrons together, so don't start putting the electrons in yet. The whole molecule, they, they're going to come together. Now let's go up and deal with the 2p. How many molecular orbitals do you expect to get from the 2p atomic orbitals? One. Not one. Six. six. Right? We start with six atomic orbitals, so we have to end up with six molecular orbitals. That's right, but orbitals have to form orbitals regardless of whether or not they have the electrons. So that they all have to be accounted for. Um, because we don't know where those two electrons are going to end up. Um, we're going to pool them all and redistribute them. Okay, so remember our rules. Um, sigma tends to be lower in energy than pi, and um, star, uh, bonding orbitals are lower than antibonding orbitals. So we think about the different interactions we can have from two p orbitals. They can combine and form a sigma bond, end on end, or they can combine and form pi bonds this way. And remember, there are three different p orbitals in the three different directions, all orthogonal to each other. So you got one, two, three. These two are going to form a sigma bond, these two a pi bond, and these two another pi bond. So that means from the six p orbitals we expect to get one sigma bond, one pi bond, another pi bond, and then the antibonding, the corresponding antibonding orbitals from each of those. So a sigma star, a pi star, and a pi star. So let's put those down. Uh, we'll get our sigma first. And this one we're going to call the sigma 2p because it's the sigma bond that's coming from the 2p orbitals. And then next up in energy, actually I'm going to make this a little bit lower um, so we have room. Next highest in energy, 
will be the pi's. Now, of the we know there are two different pi bonds, this one and this one. Do you expect one to be lower in energy than the other, or should they be the same? The same. Right? There's no real difference in that interaction. They're just oriented differently. So that means that the two different pi orbitals will be the same energy. And that's going to be our pi 2p. There's going to be two of them. So it's not this skew star 2p? Sigma. Uh, a sigma star 2p? Not yet. That one's going to be there, but not yet. So that's what comes next. Now we have to account for the antibonding orbitals. And the antibonding orbitals are higher in energy than the original electrons, because it's a energetically unfavorable situation. So next is going to be our sigma star, and then our pi star. Okay, the antibonding equivalents of the orbitals that we just talked about. Okay, now we have all the orbitals taken care of. So let's draw those dotted lines in. Um, those are coming from here and here. And then all of these are coming from the two Ps. And there's our molecular orbital diagram of, of the orbitals so far. So now what do we have to do? Add the electrons. How many electrons? Six. Six total. So remember, you've got to pool all the electrons and then fill them up. You don't keep them with their corresponding orbitals. Everything gets filled and then everything gets, or everything gets grouped and then redistributed. So we're going to say six electrons total. Let's build up six electrons into this uh, structure from the bottom up. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we have a complete molecular orbital diagram for B2 uh, diboron molecule. Okay. And as usual, it can be instructive to look at the bond order. How many bonding orbitals here, or bonding electrons? How many electrons are in bonding orbitals? Four, because you got the two in the sigma 2s and the two in the sigma 2p. So that's four. And how many antibonding? Two from the sigma star 2s. And so our bond order is one. So you would expect a single bond there, which we do see. All right? So far so good? Okay. We got what five minutes? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about magnetism. Weird thing to just jump to. We talked about paramagnetism and diamagnetism in terms of atoms, but it's um, useful to go back and look at those definitions again, since we're going to talk about it with molecules now. Paramagnetism is something is attracted to a magnetic field, and diamagnetism it's repelled. Um, and the, but this is the important part here. Paramagnetism is associated with when you have unpaired electrons. And diamagnetism is when they're all paired. Do you remember when we did that? When we were counting up the electrons and the Ps, or, and if you had unpaired ones, we called it paramagnetic? What were you going to say? Yeah, so this is the same thing. Except instead of looking at the individual boron molecules or atoms, we look at the molecule. So let me ask you, an individual boron atom would you expect it to be paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Why? Just one boron atom. Would it be para or dia? Magnetic. Paramagnetic because it has one unpaired electron, right? So it has one paired, unpaired electron. We'd expect that to be paramagnetic for the atom. But now the B2 molecule, what do you expect with that? should be diamagnetic because the electrons are all paired in the molecule. And molecular orbital diagrams do a great job of predicting whether or not 
a given um, molecule is going to be para or diamagnetic based on whether or not there are paired or unpaired electrons in the molecular world diagram. Definitions? Yeah. All right. So we just said that we predicted that, but it's actually not quite right. Our, our diagram was a nice try. It sort of makes sense, but let's make a little note here that it's not quite right. And the reason I didn't tell you this initially is because I wanted you to kind of think about the steps and how we put this thing together. But not quite, the thing that's not quite right is not as important. Um, let me see if I have this. Do I have the picture? I don't have the picture in here. All right, I'll have to pull that in from the, uh, from the book. Let's look at our orbitals first. Oh, this thing finally came out. Good. Um... Oh, here we go. This is kind of a weird looking scan of a thing, so it's kind of dark. Um, looks like somebody just scanned a book or something, yeah. But that's all right. It's, it's what we want to look at, so you, can get, you get the idea. On the top, you see two p orbitals coming together. Their phases aren't shown, but these are the two types of orbitals they form, a sigma on the bottom and a sigma star on the top. So you see how the sigma star, they kind of repel each other and it becomes bigger. And then the same thing with pi. The two different pi bonds that form from the two different directional p orbitals, they either come together and form a pi bonding orbital or they form a pi star anti-bonding orbital where the lobes are kind of pushed away from each other and out of phase. Okay. So actually, um, I'm going to leave the molecular orbital stuff at that since we're at the end and I don't want to just throw this rest of this thing in. Just keep in mind that diagram we did is not quite right. Um, check your book if you want to know why, but we'll get into that on Monday. You may need to go on a little bit in your book um, to finish the Mastering Chemistry, but we're ba we've basically done what needs to be done with uh, molecular orbital. So we'll just finish up a little bit on Monday. But That's also chapter 10, yeah. Well, what happens, I guess I could just tell you, what happens is this is not the correct ordering of orbitals in energy for the p orbitals. Okay. Um, it actually, what? This won't be on the quiz tomorrow. But actually, the sigma star ends up up here, and then these two switch back and forth depending on which atom you're talking about, which atoms you're talking about. So you can check your book for that ordering. Otherwise, what we did was correct. The energetic ordering is not quite right. And I'll see you uh, tomorrow morning for the quiz in the last lab of the year. Yeah, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, no. No. No pre-lab.